Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith, and I'm continuing um, a series of videos, um, which is kind of uh, my mishmash on the most important and significant happenings with abrupt climate change um, in the last few months. So at the end of this video, of the last video rather, I was talking about, I showed this, um, I showed this movie on daily mean Arctic temperatures. It's from 1958 to 2018. We, we go through the year January to the, we go through the year January's here, December's here. This uh, line here is the long-term average. Okay, and what we can see is, is um, as we play the movie, it starts, it shows uh, the temperature anomaly um, and how it changes. So, you know, it's balanced about the line initially with the equal reds and equal uh, blues, and then it goes to more and more red. And so it's much, much warmer now in the winters. And uh, actually in the summer, the blue line is lower. Um, the, the, the blue line is lower than the, uh, the background white line is coming up through here. Okay, so it's actually a bit colder in the summers, and this makes sense because the temperature is pegged to um, around zero, around the melting point. You know, it's actually minus 1.8 um, is the point that the seawater will freeze when it's got 35 uh, parts per thousand salinity in the ocean. Uh, but a lot of the brine is ejected, so even in first year ice, um, there's, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, that 35 parts per thousand goes down to maybe 10 or 15 parts per thousand. Um, when that ice um, melts, it keeps the temperature close to the uh, melting point. Okay, so in the summer is what we're seeing is, so, so what will happen when there's no sea ice? This effect here, being pegged close to zero, is completely due to there being sea ice and these latent heat effects. So in a blue ocean event with no sea ice, uh, what will happen is in the Arctic is these temperature anomalies here, which are in the winter, will also occur in the summer. So you can project this height up here and the scatter will increase here. So this scatter here will occur all the way up this curve. It'll occur in the, in the summer because there's no ice to peg the temperature to, 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 to freezing and it'll continue here. So probably it's going to be increasing um, you know, in, 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 the, um, in the winters here as well. And certainly, um, yeah, yeah. So it, it's just, uh, I mean, it's very clear from, from this plot, you know, and I'll just play it once more. It's very clear what, what's going to happen. Okay, this temperature anomaly will continue up through the summers and will be in a very, very different planet. The jet streams will reconfigure to be centered more over Greenland. Greenland melt will take off going to be very difficult to grow food, enough food to feed the, uh, you know, the exponentially growing population. Um, so yeah, we, we're, we're in, we're in a, a soup, in the soup here. Um, this video I did uh, recently, hunkering down for the deluge and flood in the climate casino, talking about, you know, how, you know, no city is, is, is um, exempt from, from climate disruption. You know, so I talk about, you know, how do you harden your house against, against flooding? Uh, this is a, um, these are temperature anomalies in the Arctic last month. You can see a cold area, global warming hole sort of here. And look at these huge temperature anomalies in the Arctic, five degrees Celsius. That's on, that's for the whole month of April, average for the whole month of April. Um, crops are at huge risk from climate change, from our changing climate. Global warming could bring yet more challenges to a hungry world. So exponential population growth, yields dropping, crops being destroyed. I mean, the planting is delayed by a month or two months in the in vast parts of the U.S. You know, there, this will likely cause food price spikes because, you know, a lot of the crops grown in Europe are also suffering because it's extremely cold. We've had this persistent jet stream uh jet stream trough over north america and it's uh it, it's uh basically continuing into the spring so instead of uh being super cold and getting uh you know lots of snow it's much colder than normal and low pressure um low atmospheric pressure and lots of 
rainfall and uh you know lots of tornadoes and lots of uh storms in the US and you know they haven't been able to plant so obviously we're going to run into problems soon with with food supply um this is another image uh posted by the world this is by the world meteorological organization um they follow me that's good that's where they get their stuff from uh <laughs> you know about a degree warmer than the 1951 to 1980 average. So what does this mean? Remember, if you want to go back to the, the turn of the century average, you need to add about 0 0.3. So we do it at 1.3 degrees Celsius. If you want to go back to 1750, you'd have to add another 0.3, so 1.6. So if you compare us to the original baseline of pre-industrial revolution, 1750, the whole month of April was at 1.6, already well over the 1.5 uh, Paris uh, temperature and, and rapidly approaching the two degree um, temperature. And uh, this isn't even in an El Nino year or anything. Well, the El Nino is very, very weak. Um, this is interesting just to show you, uh, you know, the, just to remind you the reason oxygen, the reason, you know, the atmosphere is about 79% nitrogen, about 20 or 78% nitrogen and 21% oxygen at the moment. Uh, going back, uh, this is in billions of years, there was no oxygen on the planet. Um, plants, when plants evolved, then they started producing oxygen. The oxygen started rising up, okay? Uh, during the Carboniferous period, um, very, very warm, lots of vegetation, the atmosphere was up to about 30% probably limited here by fires. You know, if you get up higher and higher, then there's going to be a lot more fires from lightning bursts and that will that will uh, drop the vegetation. So we've stabilized at a level of about 21%. And, um, you know, it's interesting looking at the, the history of it. Uh, I don't know why that's not showing. Let's go to the original thing. Okay, so it's a wiki pa uh, Wikipedia page. And so basically these stages, you can get more information. No oxygen in the atmosphere in stage one. Um, oceans anoxic, maybe oxygen in shallow oceans, if there was plant life in shallow oceans. Stage two, oxygen produced, but it's very reactive, so absorbed in the rock and sea ocean. And then stage three, it starts to get up into the atmosphere. You know, stage uh, four, um, uh, and five, um, other oxygen reservoirs are filled, gas accumulates in the atmosphere. So, you know, very, very interesting um, uh, page there and diagram. So oxygen concentration has varied. Now, this is interesting. If you're, you know, like in the many places, you know, it's a no brainer to get solar panels. If, you, if the average cost of a five kilowatt system in 2019, it's dropping. Okay, and you can get loans to, to, uh, to install solar panels because they pay back very quickly, you know, based on the energy you're generating from the solar panels, you, play, you can pay off the interest and the principal. And this is a lifetime savings, 100K or more in these states, you know, um, 50K or more in these states and 25K or more in, in these states. So, you know, wherever you are in the U.S., uh, you can make money uh, on uh, solar power. A her Herculean rant to rouse humanity. Um, I like, uh, you know, here's a very great, I'm humbled by what Ben C. said here. Here's a great, very human, inspiring video from scientist uh, me. I don't have a lot of hope, I said, but things aren't hopeless either. You have compassion for people and you try to make a difference. You know, we all have to try to solve this problem. Um, this is interesting. Uh, you know, people think differently about probability. You know, what kind of probability are people talking about when they say something has almost no chance or it's almost certain? So this is a great chart. Um, you know, if something, if we say something's almost certain, most people think that means um, what, about 95%. Some people think it's 100%. Some people think it's as low as 70 or 80%. You know, and the, the, the width of these curves and the peak does vary. The shape of these curves varies, you know, so we doubt, you know, look at the, 
there, there's a lot of variation. So this is very interesting. You can try to, you know, look on these curves. Like, like when you hear these terms, assign a percentage to it of what you think. And then look at this curve and see where you are. See if you're near the peak or to the right or left or whatever. It, it, it sort of is a very good um, exercise to figure out your, your um, thoughts when you hear these, these probability terms. Um, this is interesting. I've talked about this previous, um, you know, because of the heat waves and stuff, we're going to have to cool our bodies artificially. So if you, uh, you know, I talked about an Indian company that uses thermoelectric coolers uh, or some to, to create sort of a chill suit, if you like, you know, a jacket or, or, or a shirt that you wear that cools your body. So when you're you know, that would allow you to survive outside, uh, you know, at 35 degrees Celsius with a wet bulb temperature of, of uh, w w well, when the humidity is, uh, you know, 100% at 35 degrees Celsius, that's the wet bulb limit of the human body. Normally, you'd only survive outside for six to eight hours, but wearing a suit that chills you um, would make you okay. You'd probably be able to withstand that sort of thing, uh, or at least deal with heat waves a lot better. So. This is work um, at University of California, San Diego on this patch, you know, personal cooler. And you think if, if uh, you know, air conditioning is so much energy intensive, you know, we have to basically cool a whole room. Um, what if people cooled their bodies individually by wearing these types of devices? And then uh, we wouldn't need air conditioning. We wouldn't need rooms that were so cold. You know, if your body was comfortable because of this suit that you are wearing, this chill suit, then um, you know that would be a much more, a much uh, less energy intensive way of, of keeping people cool. Um, this is an interesting idea. Um, I'm connected with the Healthy Climate Alliance. Um, I've, I've met people um, at the American Geophysical Union that are working on this idea. The idea of ICE 9/11 with um, is to treat ice with silica microbeads and those are reflective and that would allow the ice to thicken more in the winter and to, to it would be reflecting more of the sunlight and not melt out as quickly. So the idea is to spreading these beads in a few strategic locations like the Beaufort Gyre or the Fram Strait could maybe reverse some of the melting across the Arctic. If you blocked up the Fram Strait, we had these beads and thickened the ice there then that would stop, uh, greatly reduce the export, for example. So there's some interesting work being done with that. Um, this is interesting about some of the human psychologies on experts, okay? Uh, experts are more and more and more specialized by our um, definition of the word. You know, an expert, you become more and more specialized in a very narrow field and you're actually blind. It actually blinds you and you're very bad at predicting the future, even within the field that you're an expert in. People that are much more joining the dots, um, you know, big picture thinkers, trying to connect all of the pieces of the puzzle are far better at predicting the, the future than so-called experts. And, you know, I, I put myself in, into, into that category um, and there's some interesting books. There's a book called Super Forecasting um, um, by a local um, Ottawa author. Um, and it's about how terrible experts are at predicting things. That, but there are groups of people. Um, and I, you know, I'm, I'm within the, this group of people that are much more generalists and reading all the news stories and understanding you know all the pieces of the puzzle and you know making predictions as to what's going to happen so uh, super forecasters um, and uh, I think um, I've covered a lot I just want to show this you know storm chasing tornado chasing um, they're starting to use uh, drones so here's a video of uh, you know of, of a drone. So these are professional drone racers who are getting these very sophisticated drones and they're able to uh, go up into thunderstorms and uh, take images of and, and measure uh, data on, on uh, tornadoes. It's uh, fascinating stuff. Anyway, um, 
Oh, I should really show this. Okay, I'll have to do one more video. Thanks.